On this Wednesday night, if the NAFTA talks are a game of chicken, neither Canada nor the U.S. has flinched yet. Today, after some harsh words from U.S. lawmakers, the two countries' top negotiators met again face-to-face. -face. So what did Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Christian Freeland, make of it? And why was Doug Ford on the scene? Also tonight, an inside look at the business of ticket scalping that you've got to see to believe. We've gone undercover to detail a secret ticket master program and what it seems to mean for regular buyers. You be the judge. This is The National. The U.S. says it's do or die time for NAFTA negotiations. Canada must cut a deal, say Republicans, or else. But in Washington today, there's no sign Canadian negotiators are buckling under or backing down. Our Katie Simpson takes us behind the scenes. NAFTA negotiators needed a shot of caffeine after a marathon sitting of intense talks. Our negotiators have been really, really hard at it, including an all-night session last night of one team that just ended at 7 a.m. this morning. But those uh, so round-the-clock we discussions have yet to lead to a breakthrough. Sources tell CBC News talks remain steady but slow and that Canada is not going to be rushed into a fast finish. If talks don't wrap up by the U.S.-imposed deadline of the end of the month, the Canadians expect to be on the receiving end of more intense, blunt and brutal public criticism. Canada is already being pressured by influential Republicans to fall in line or risk being cut out of the deal. Canada needs to really step up here this week. We're not going to change the deadlines, uh, Republicans in the new trade rules. The Prime Minister is dismissing that pressure, suggesting the U.S. needs to be ready to compromise. We're going to need to see a, a certain amount of movement in order to get there, and that's uh, certainly what we're, uh, we're hoping what about to see. Canadian Labour leaders are amplifying that message, saying it's the Americans who need to play ball. They're going to have to start to signal that they are going to move on these issues in a serious way. If not, there won't be a deal, and that would be unfortunate, but they're going to have to take the blame for that. A more unlikely ally also came to Justin Trudeau's side today, the Conservative yeah. Premier of Ontario. I just want to reconfirm again, uh, province of Ontario is standing shoulder to shoulder with their federal government, and uh, we're going to get this deal done, hopefully uh, sooner than later. Doug Ford stuck to the Team Canada script during his day trip to Washington for an update on the talks. While he didn't meet with any U.S. lawmakers, Ford also didn't give the Americans any reason to doubt Canada is anything but united on NAFTA. Lower-level technical negotiators are going to keep talking through the night with those high-level talks between Minister Freeland and her American counterpart picking up tomorrow. And Katie, what do we know about where these talks are stuck? It's the big sore points that have really been a problem since these negotiations began 13 months ago. Uh, sources tell CBC News that both Canada's dairy industry, which is a problem for the Americans, that was discussed today, as was Canada's demand to keep a dispute resolution system, an independent one, within NAFTA. Uh, a source tells me tonight that conversations today were full and frank. Now, if there is going to be some sort of breakthrough this week, it has to happen tomorrow. Canada foreign affairs minister is expected to be in Montreal on Friday to host female foreign ministers so she won't be able to stick around into the end of the week. Katie Simpson in Washington again tonight. Thanks. Thanks. Well, Katie mentioned the renegotiations began just over a year ago and since then deadlines have repeatedly come and gone. Some even feel these dates on the calendar have become meaningless but there is concern things may be different this time around. Well how many have we already passed? It was supposed to be done in, uh, by December of 2017, then March, then June, now September. Now, so who knows? I think this one has some validity to it. Why? Well, because by September 30th, President Trump has to present the full and final agreement to Congress. And that deadline was set because the White House wants to ink a deal while Mexico's current president, Enrique Peña Nieto, is still in office before a new leftist successor starts December 1st. Still ahead tonight, we go undercover in Las Vegas at a conference for ticket resellers. Are they secretly getting help from Ticketmaster? We're digging into an international mystery. Fan Bing Bing, one of China's most famous actresses, seems to have disappeared. So what happened to her?
But first, the dramatic showdown in Washington over Donald Trump's Supreme Court nominee and the woman who says he sexually assaulted her. Uh, I think he's an extraordinary man. Donald Trump is standing by his man, Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, even casting doubt on the sexual assault allegations made against him. Very hard for me to imagine that anything happened. Right? California professor Christine Blasey Ford came forward just this week, alleging a teenaged Kavanaugh attacked her at a high school party decades ago, pinning her to a bed, groping her, and trying to take off her clothes. Kavanaugh says those claims are completely false, and he's committed to clearing his name at a public hearing on Monday before senators vote to approve his nomination. But still a mystery whether his accuser will testify herself. She wants the FBI to investigate her allegations first, but it would fall to Trump himself to order that investigation, and he's already ruled that out. You need to have this thorough investigation first before she should be forced to testify. What if this was your daughter? Wouldn't you want some modicum of investigation and a sense of fair treatment? And that is not what's happening. Should the FBI investigate the allegations? What's unclear now is if Republicans would even go ahead with the hearings if Ford isn't there. Well, where I'm focused right now is doing everything that we can to make uh, Dr. Ford comfortable with coming before our committee. But today, even Republican senators who have supported Ford are saying that if she doesn't testify next week, the committee might just have to move on to a vote anyway. Now, Keith Bogue is watching this frantic back and forth for us in Washington. And Keith, on the idea of just trying to forge ahead, how big is the risk there? Well, it's no secret, Andrew, that Republicans have a problem attracting the support of women voters. That's a large part of the reason their backs appear to be against the wall in the midterms, which are now just a little more than six weeks away. So, ramming through a Supreme Court nominee without regard to an accusation of sexual assault against him, that's not going to help them in that regard. But the spectacle of a hearing in which Republicans might ham-handedly challenge the credibility of a woman making such an allegation, well, that's a risky proposition, too. Right, which is a good point. And, and I wonder, is, is there any possibility that this could really go sideways, that Kavanaugh's nomination might be withdrawn or, or that it might fail in the Senate? Well, things are moving so quickly in this story that I wouldn't want to speculate on how it will turn out. But certainly there are scenarios in play now that weren't in play a week ago. Key Republican senators have wavered on Kavanaugh. And if they don't have the votes to confirm him, then withdrawal of the nomination or defeat in the Senate are the only other options. Keith Bogue in Washington. Thanks very much. It's been a big day for Doug Ford. You saw him in Washington talking trade, but he also scored a big victory in that battle over the size of Toronto City Council. We're going we're gonna to move forward with it. We're going to move forward with building transit and infrastructure and housing in Toronto, and, and I'm, I'm quite happy and I'm very grateful uh, for the court's decision. Ontario's highest court suspended the ruling that called Ford's bill to shrink council unconstitutional. That means there's no need to pass legislation invoking the notwithstanding clause. Toronto's election will happen on schedule next month, though Toronto's mayor says the legal fight will continue. Our lawyers have clear direction to continue to fight because the course of action engaged in here was and is wrong. This is a big turn in a story that's galvanized public opinion across the country, though nowhere more than in Canada's largest city itself. So how are council candidates dealing with the chaos? Ron Charles has that story. I'm sure you know that the election is October 22nd. Yep. So it's official. Yep. It's happening now. Toronto City Council candidate Kristen Wong Tam is spending a lot of her time out campaigning, trying to explain the tumultuous Toronto election to confused voters. Okay, have a great day, sir. Thank you. Over the past yeah. month, the ward she's Thank running for re-election in more than doubled in size, then shrank yeah. back down to its original size until today when it became giant again. The latest, likely final change merges four city wards into one, pitting Wong Tam against friends and allies for the seat. There are people that I've mentored, people I've encouraged to run, uh, people who I've donated to my own personal dollars to because I felt that they would be very good representatives. And I still hope that there is a way for us to all work together. One of those friends plans to drop out rather than run against Wong Tam. I was actually the front runner in, my, in the race that I was in in Ward 25. 
So now, you know, I'm left out in the, in, in, in the dark pretty much. Balloon business owner Katharina Perez is one of 30 candidates who are running against Wong Tam, the high number the result of merging all those wards into one. Perez is undaunted. It's a huge ward and I'm willing to take it on. I can do the job. I think that those who are complaining are doing so because they're not able to do it. Several wards over, incumbent councillor Jim Karagiannis had already been running as if the council was smaller and the wards larger, something he supports. I just added 30,000 more constituents. It's, it's a walk in the park. It's, you know what, you've got to be willing to do it. You've got to rise to the, to the challenge. And if you can't do it, retire. Hi, I'm Kristen Wong Tam. I'm Wong Tam is sticking with her plan to run in the latest giant version of her ward. Meanwhile, the city has reopened the nomination period for the next two days to allow candidates to officially drop out or pick new wards. Another turn in Toronto's roller coaster election. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Just a reminder of why this matters so much. Here's a look at how many people Toronto's city council governs in the national context. With more than 2.7 million residents, Toronto's the largest municipality in Canada. And it makes the government here the sixth biggest in the country after the federal government than those in the provinces of Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia and Alberta. Well, she is one of China's most famous actresses, known here in North America perhaps for her role in X-Men, Days of Future Past. But tonight, Fan Bingbing is making headlines around the world because no one knows where she is. The 37-year-old has seemingly vanished, not a public sighting in more than two months. The CBC's Renee Filipponi picks up the trail of mystery. Like most celebrities, Fan Bingbing lived in the spotlight, from red carpets to massive ad campaigns. Now, nothing but rumors and so many questions. I would compare her to Angelina Jolie. She's an A-list celeb in China, for sure. This Vancouver Mandarin radio host says this story is a big deal. Fans want to know what happened. I feel like the whole entertainment industry kind of shaken a little bit. And then I see like uh, a lot of celebs, they've been, yeah, kind of low-key, you know, like not really coming out, saying anything about Bingbing's uh, situation. Some reports suggest she may be under investigation for hiding a big part of her income. The government has made no official statement, though some say it's possible Bing Bing is in some form of custody. It's an example of uh, killing the chicken to scare the monkey. Which this is UBC today. professor uh, points to an old Chinese idiom to suggest another possible reason, that her disappearance has nothing to do with tax evasion. He says the last post she made on Weibo, Chinese Twitter, was from a children's hospital in Tibet, a politically sensitive region for China. They had been active for, you know, for a long time, but yeah. uh, in, in using the mechanisms of state enforcement mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to discourage people from taking positions they don't like and to punish people who do take positions yeah. they don't like. Artist and activist Ai Weiwei was held for three months in 2011, also charged with tax evasion. Another possible example of how speaking out against the communist regime comes at a cost. That price is evident on the streets of Beijing, where people are unwilling to speculate. This woman says it's time to follow the process according to the law. Another suggesting she is just taking some downtime. That's unlikely. Bing Bing is set to star in a massive Hollywood spy movie, but her future is unclear, as the international celebrity who has disappeared now lives under a cloud of suspicion. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Now let's get you up to speed on some of the other developing stories on our radar tonight. Starting with the U.S. president's tour of the hurricane-ravaged Carolinas. Washington is with you. Trump is with you. We are all with you 100 percent, and uh, we'll get through it. Donald Trump promising federal support today as he got a first-hand look at communities hit hard by Hurricane Florence. The number of dead now stands at 37. Thousands of people are still in shelters, though, and authorities warn they're not entirely in the clear yet. River levels are still rising, and more flooding is possible. Police were on scene on Ireland's west coast today after severe winds blew a trailer off a cliff, killing a woman inside. She was one of two people killed as Storm Ali lashed parts of the British Isles with heavy rain and gusts of over 140 kilometers an hour. 
For much of the day, the storm wreaked havoc, grounding flights and tearing down trees and power lines. An update tonight on the search off Prince Edward Island for two fishermen lost at sea. Authorities have called off their official water search for the two men, but the RCMP says it will still keep scouring the shoreline for them. They went missing yesterday evening after their boat capsized in stormy weather. A third fisherman was also on board at the time, but he was able to swim back to shore and call for help. Oh, what the and this is video of an attack at a St. John's High School today that might have involved bear spray. Witnesses say it happened at lunchtime during a fight between two rival groups in the school. No one was seriously hurt, but police say more than a dozen students were exposed to that spray and one person had to be taken to hospital. Ahead tonight on The National, New Brunswick's next premier may not speak French. With just days until the election, we'll look at how that's playing out in Canada's only officially bilingual province. Also, tonight's National Dispatch takes us to a city in Morocco for an in-depth look at how people there are desperately trying to find a way into Europe. First, though, a special undercover investigation will show you how Ticketmaster is secretly helping resellers game their own system. I want to I wanna know the straight goods on whether Ticketmaster is going to be policing us using our multiple accounts. Uh, no. If you bought a ticket to a major league sports event or a superstar musician's concert, chances are you've dealt with Ticketmaster. That is, if you could get a ticket. As we've reported here on The National, it seems that ticket scalpers, some using computer bots, snap up many of the best tickets before you have a chance at them. And now we've learned Ticketmaster is in business with those scalpers. In a joint investigation between CBC News and the Toronto Star, our Dave Seglins used a hidden camera to get inside a Las Vegas conference on the international ticket selling industry. What Dave and producer Rachel Houlihan discovered is that Ticketmaster not only co-sponsored the conference, it was actively recruiting scalpers. The bright lights, the bars, the gambling. What happens in Vegas is supposed to stay in Vegas. Unless, of course, it's caught on camera. And that's why we're here, to peer inside a notoriously secretive industry at a meeting, a conference of international ticket scalpers. It is Ticket Summit 2018. And who's going to be there? Ticketmaster. It's such a bizarre thing, right? Like, why would Ticketmaster be at a conference that's completely dedicated and designed and geared towards ticket scalpers. Like it just, it's like something I think people have a hard time getting their head around. Ticketmaster is the world's largest box office. It controls most tickets for the biggest acts. And it's finding new ways to profit from fans. Now, look at this. Verified resale tickets. This is the box office Ticketmaster. Look at all these. I know. $1,400, $1,300, $1,700. Most people think Ticketmaster is the box office, like the original yes. face value tickets. But now they're doing resale. We decided to investigate. We got inside the Scalper Conference with an official news team, but also we went undercover. No longer Dave Seglins of CBC, but posing as a small-time ticket broker from Toronto, David Jeffrey of DGS Promotions. Ticketmaster was busy, surrounded by scalpers, some of the very people who use ticket-buying software and fake identities to scoop up tickets. Turns out Ticketmaster has a secret program. How you doing, man? Good. Good to see you. A new online system to help scalpers sell huge volumes. Oh. extremely small, that have had just a few sets of tickets, and frankly just had the gumption to, to try, and they've become pretty good partners for me, you know, doing half a million or whatever, 
but I've had guys that start half a million off. dollars or half a million tickets? In sales. So, in total. Yeah. Yeah. But is Ticketmaster on the lookout for cheats, those scalpers who use fake identities to scoop up tickets? I want to know the straight goods on whether Ticketmaster is going to be policing us using our multiple accounts. Uh, no. I have, I have a gentleman who's got over 200 Ticketmaster.com accounts. How many brokers are using multiple accounts? I'd say pretty damn near every one of them. I think they have to because if you, you want to get a good show at the ticket limit six or eight. Okay. You're not going to make a living on eight, eight tickets. No. Okay. So that's Ticketmaster telling us that they have brokers who have hundreds of Ticketmaster fake accounts and they don't care if they're using those fake accounts to buy up all the tickets and then repost them for resale so long as Ticketmaster is getting a cut of course. And Ticketmaster is making it dead easy with Trade Desk, what it calls the most powerful ticket sales tool ever. CBC got inside. Again, posing as a scalper, we signed up and got a demonstration. So is this what I would see? Yeah, this is exactly what you'd see. I tell him I'm just starting out, reselling about $100,000 worth of hockey tickets each year. So I kind of feel like I'm a bit of a small fish. Yeah, 100000 I mean, we would definitely get you on, get you started. Um, I think this would be like a really good learning system for you. Um, hmm. So yeah, there would be no... No qualms about that whatsoever. Again, no problem if you're using multiple identities. We've spent millions of dollars on this tool, so the last thing we'd want to do is, you know, get brokers caught up to where they can't sell inventory with us or kind of like a way to think of it. We're not trying to build a better mousetrap. Hey, it's Alan Cross, and a new season of Ongoing History Shows means new Ongoing History podcasts. Alan Cross is a veteran music journalist. This spring, during Canadian Music Week, he interviewed Ticketmaster's CEO. What are ticket brokers, and how do they get their stuff? There are good brokers. There are um, folks that don't necessarily play by the rules. Um, people who use bots are absolute cheaters, and we, we don't like them, and we don't want them in the system. We showed Alan Cross our Vegas videos of Ticketmaster's scalper program. Now, I have heard of this. I have heard of, uh, there's been whispers of this in the ticket selling uh, community, um, but it's never been outlined quite like this before. So people will look at this and see this is, as a form of collusion, that on one hand they say, um, you know, we don't like bots, we're not using bots, but on the other hand, we have all these clients who may use bots. Uh, it does seem a bit stinky, doesn't it? I know you're just sort of digesting this, but what's the implication here for Ticketmaster? This is going to be a public relations nightmare, and it's probably going to have some authorities asking some pretty tough questions as to whether or not this is illegal or not. In Canada, the Competition Bureau is watching. But in the U.S., they've gone further. The Department of Justice has opened an investigation. Amidst allegations, Ticketmaster is abusing its grip on the industry. Well, they're scalpers. They're no different than a guy standing out in front of the stadium asking, you need tickets, buddy? U.S. Congressman Bill Pascrell is one of Ticketmaster's biggest critics. I think what you just showed me and what I've been talking about for 10 years should be illegal. It is not illegal because we don't have the courage to stand up, pass some laws that protect the consumer. The secondary market is corrupt right now, and it's only gonna get worse. Ticketmaster declined our repeated request for an interview. They provided only a statement. We believe it's our job to offer a marketplace that provides a safe and fair place for fans to shop, buy, and sell tickets. We operate our marketplace more transparently and securely than any other. Ticketmaster spent several days in Vegas schmoozing with scalpers, but the company won't talk about it, won't even acknowledge its scalper program exists, unless it seems you're on the inside. I'll bump you an email. Any questions you think of on your way home or whatever? Okay. Shoot them over to me. I'll address it. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Las Vegas. As Dave mentioned, Ticketmaster gets a cut of resale, so making money twice for the same ticket in some cases. Here's an example. Ticketmaster will collect a fee on the initial sale of that ticket, of course. Then when the owner posts the same ticket on the site for resale, Ticketmaster collects another fee. And according to a copy of Ticketmaster's official reseller handbook obtained by CBC, the company seems to encourage volume reselling. 
it will knock percentage points off its fees as scalpers hit sales milestones. And later on The National, we sit down with voters in New Brunswick, where the languages leaders speak has become a big issue in the provincial election campaign. But up next, Nell Ayed's dispatch from the north coast of Morocco. We go in-depth tracking migrants' risky journey from Africa and the Middle East to Europe. It's the dog that gives the first signal that someone is hiding. Then it's a matter of finding them. In many ways, the world has become a population on the move. People forced from their homes by conflict, persecution, or disaster. Almost 70 million, according to the UN Refugee Agency. As one person is displaced every two seconds, this global migration comes with a global impact. And it's an issue the National is exploring in depth this season. Tonight, we're focused on northern Morocco, a city that is technically part of Spain. It's a flashpoint for migrants looking for a safe bridge into Europe, but to get there, they first have to smuggle themselves across a heavily barricaded border. Now, Ayed has this dispatch from the city of Melilla. It is only when Melia's annual fair is over that these kids come looking for a ride. It's a yearly ritual for migrant children to stop the folded Ferris wheel and bumper cars for a spot to hide, to ride along across the sea to mainland Europe. For those packing up, the night's tougher job is trying to keep those kids away. Can you show me? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, you know, yeah, this yeah. kind of... Yeah, yeah. yeah. My God. Okay. You never said okay. in Zima. Yeah. The stand is for Nendo. Yeah. They hide there. Yeah. But they are determined to follow others to France, Germany, and beyond. And in this city, every truck, every car and ferry is a chance to leave this life in limbo behind. The continent is Africa, but on its edge is a sliver of Spain since the 15th century. Morocco is there, just a fence away. A statue to Franco, the dictator, still stands here. So does Melia's old reputation as a coveted gateway to Europe. Migration has long been central to Melia's story. You can see it on the streets. Now, as the migrant route shifts to Spain, many are again counting on Melia to have Europe's back. As a frontier town, Melia has long been witness to exceptional misery. A caravan of needs that drive endless movement across its border. At this crossing, the poorest of Morocco's women, many of them widows and single moms, can work as portiadoras, mule women, to earn a few euros for each back-breaking package of duty-free goods they carry to merchants back in Morocco. Many of them do this every single day. As a Spanish enclave, Melia's borders are protected by Spanish National Police and the Civil Guard, who gave us access and a guide, Jose Luis Roman. There's a lot of migratory pressure, he says, and it's not just overland, as you can see at this fence, but there's also migratory pressure over the sea as well. 
A key part of their job is keeping people out. And key to that is a triple fence that contains Fortress Europe and keeps Africa out. It starts and ends at the sea. This version, 20 years and millions in Spanish and EU money in the making. Six meters high and designed to make it hard to scale. Those hooks up there tell of someone who tried. So this is Morocco. Marruecos. Moroccan forces, also helped by EU dollars, act like a retaining wall. The fence is monitored 24-7. Motion sensors, infrared cameras, all make it possible to respond to an alarm within a minute. All of it has brought the numbers down over the years. But with word spreading that Spain is the best route into Europe now, the numbers are slowly creeping up, and people still try the fence daily. People like Osama from Yemen, who tried twice before he made it over. There's no other way, he says. I was told the easiest way was over the fence to jump. A few years ago, Malia saw more than a few mass jumps. The last this year was in January. In the only other Spanish enclave, Ceuta, down the coast, smugglers were blamed when hundreds stormed and jumped the fence this summer. A feat they celebrated. Human rights advocates have called out Spain for deporting some asylum seekers without considering their claims. Critics include Dunia Mansouri from the local opposition. The Spanish police can now just throw the illegals back over the fence, she says. Those people are not helped or cared for properly. And if they can't get over the fence, people have gone through it or around it, smuggled by sea or by car. Just a day before our visit, they found a 15-year-old in a car, wrapped in a blanket, hidden behind the seats. We've seen cases in the most unbelievable places, he says, like dashboards, inside spare tires, under the seats, even inside the fuel tank. So many still make it in that the main temporary shelter is at many times its capacity. No place for families, they say, never mind infants. You meet all kinds passing the time outside. Some are smuggled in on rafts, like Alucin Diallo, who escaped a harsh life in Guinea. You might have to take some risks sometimes, because it is very difficult back there. And the Aqabi brothers from Yemen, once a breakdancing act on Arab Idol, now refugees. We deal with the uh, smuggler. They used to catch us in the uh, Moroccan gate, Moroccan soldiers. So they used to catch us and beat us. And we tried like nine times or 10 times. So we got in. Just describe what the situation is like inside. I just sleep two minutes, then I wake up. I get scared. The next day, they were given passage to mainland Spain, where they plan to stay. Others wait within striking distance, just a fence away from the good life, and a big step short of their European dreams. There are some services that help them navigate the limbo, like Save the Children's Spanish classes. And though there is a shelter for minors, dozens end up on the streets, some on glue or drugs and in a constant cat-and-mouse game with police as they wait for a perilous journey they aptly describe as making risky. Risk it's something like a dream, because if you reach to make risky, it means that you will arrive to the peninsula, to the mainland, to the Spain, and it means to stay during very long period, hours, in some cases, days, without food and without uh, any kind of beverage, and it's very dangerous. As the fair moves on, part of the ritual is to invite the media to the port for Operación Feriente, a 
chance to show Guardia Civil efforts at protecting Europe's southern border. By hunting for stowaways with sniffer dogs, even a heartbeat monitor. The police have to be as creative in searching as the kids are in hiding. It's the dog that gives the first signal that someone is hiding. Then it's a matter of finding them. and persuading them to come out. One way or another. In the back of this one truck, they found eight teenagers. This teenager, like many others, like many in Melilla itself, is from Morocco. Their hopes of an escape to make a life in Spain or beyond crushed. Probably not for the first time or the last. The others watch, waiting their turn. Some inevitably do make it, riding aspirations even walls fail to contain. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Melilla, Spain. And Donald Trump has offered Spain a solution to tackling its migrant problem. When King Felipe visited the White House in June, the U.S. president suggested building a wall across the Sahara. But it would have to stretch 4,800 kilometers and cross several sovereign nations. We don't know how the king responded. Ahead, on the national tongue tied in the picture province, with just days to go before their big election, New Brunswickers wonder, can someone really be premier of Canada's only officially bilingual province if they don't speak French? <laughs> Could you imagine in Canada have a, having a prime minister who cannot speak French? He'll learn five languages before Brian Gallant learns to balance a budget. First, though, we'll look at a story you'll see here tomorrow night on The National. As Puerto Rico marks exactly one year since Hurricane Maria hit, you'll meet a man who started a memorial to remember the dead and the forgotten. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Could you show us any messages or any shoes? OK. For example, Michael Ferrer died 24 of September in Dr. Center Hospital. Uh, I think the, uh, the Trump administration has been uh, cruel, uh, cynical, and, uh, and the um, amount of stupidity is unbelievable. Uh, the only word that, that Mr. Trump uses is fantastic. Everything is fantastic. And this is a fantastic uh, human calamity. Tonight on The National, we're learning of some serious charges against an Ottawa police officer. Eric Post appeared in court today on 21 counts, including sexual assault and forcible confinement. Police haven't said much about the allegations, but they did say the charges relate to four separate victims, and they're concerned there could be more. We've all heard of a wolf dressed up in sheep's clothing. Well, a wolf can wear scrubs. Disturbing case tonight in California. A surgeon and his girlfriend are accused of working together to drug and sexually assault women. The current charges relate to two women, but prosecutors say they've identified three more possible victims and there could be many more. They say they found thousands of videos and photos on the surgeon's phone. He and his girlfriend have denied the claims. It certainly has been a roller coaster of emotion and at the same time, I've received an outpouring of love, of support, of prayers. And that was Elizabeth Smart tonight after one of her convicted kidnappers, Wanda Barzi, was released from prison after 15 years. 
It was Barzee's then husband, Brian David Mitchell, who kidnapped Smart at knife point in 2002 when she was 14 years old. Smart has said that Barzee encouraged Mitchell to rape her, and she believes the woman is still dangerous. As part of the conditions of her release, Barzee was placed on the Utah Sex Offender Registry. Okay, let's turn back home now to New Brunswick. There's less than a week to go before voters there choose the province's next government. Polls suggest that of the main contenders, two parties have a realistic shot, and their leaders have been working hard to make their case. Well, thank you very much, Brent. It's always great to be uh, introduced as a local candidate. It is fun to be here today, and it's fun to be here with my colleagues. We saw Brian Gallant of the incumbent Liberals and Tory leader Blaine Higgs both working to get their messages out. Though for Higgs, the struggle is to do that in French, a language he does not speak fluently. And in Canada's only officially bilingual province, that's become a real talking point. Because while some say fluency in French should be a prerequisite to power, others counter that fluency in business and economics is much more important. Kayla Hounsell takes us right into the middle of it. Welcome to Moncton, where the election campaign is open for business in both official languages. It's part of our fabric. We still have quite a divide between the, the English and the French communities. For a third of New Brunswickers, French is the first language. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so we've invited a number of politically engaged citizens to discuss the role of language in this provincial election. The number one issue, one of the people vying to be premier can't speak French. Could you imagine in Canada have a, having a prime minister exactly. cannot speak French? Exactly. Progressive conservative leader Blaine Higgs says he's trying. <laughs> Most give him credit for that. He'll learn five languages before Brian Gallant learns to balance a budget. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? But some say it's not good enough. But I think it's critical that the leader of a party be able to communicate exceedingly well with all New Brunswickers in this case. I just don't think there's another way in 2018. The ability or inability to speak the language is one thing, but beyond that, some New Brunswickers are having trouble getting past the fact that Blaine Higgs was also a member of the core party, the Confederation of Regents. The agenda of that party at that time was against the uh, bilingualism in this province. That was 30 years ago. So it's okay with you because it was 30 well, years ago? Well, people change, you know. Like, Indeed, not... Higgs says he has changed his views. This group agrees it's not just about speaking the language, but also protecting Francophone rights and culture. What this government is trying to do it wouldn't be the province's first unilingual premier, though. In the 70s and 80s, Richard Hatfield's right-hand man became known as the French lieutenant. His champions were really from the Acadian community, so I don't think that the leader necessarily has to be fluently bilingual. He has to embrace bilingualism, and he has to be, you know, to understand the importance of bilingualism. Four years ago, the Liberals took 15 of the 16 ridings considered francophone, and that was when the Conservatives had a bilingual leader. It's anyone's guess how language might shape the result on this election night. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Moncton. Up next on The National, the celebrity chef who's under siege for serving a meal that was fit for a king. And it wasn't what he served, it's who he served it to. Our moment of the day is coming up. You may have heard the name Salt Bay before. He's a celebrity chef known for his flamboyant style, his lavish butchering, and serving very expensive cuts of meat. But now he's getting hit with some pretty fierce backlash over the company he keeps and the fact he appeared to brag about it. And that is our moment of the day. This angry crowd of Venezuelans was outside Salt Bay's Steakhouse in Miami. They're furious because earlier this week, the celebrity chef served dinner to Venezuelan president Nicolas Maduro at his Istanbul restaurant. While millions of his people are starving, Maduro enjoyed not just good old meat and potatoes, but the whole Salt Bay experience, a lavish meal complete with sensual carving and finessed with the chef's signature sunglasses, black gloves, and bicep-busting t-shirt. Meanwhile, 
Venezuela is in the grips of an economic and humanitarian crisis. Food prices there are so high, many are forced to skip meals altogether. And so, Ian, I suppose, you know, the backlash shouldn't come as any surprise. And, and his critics do seem intent on wanting to punish Salt Bay for associating with Maduro. I mean, you know, we saw footage of the protests there, but people have also been leaving one-star reviews on basically wherever they can, TripAdvisor, on Google, uh, and even with headings like immoral restaurant, uh, dictatorship supporter, it goes on. It's an interesting form of activism that has been propelled by, obviously, rage uh, from people who are connected to Venezuela, but also propelled by the speed of social media. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio uh, sent out not just his anger uh, about this, wrote about his anger, but he also listed the phone number and address of the restaurant, encouraging people to show up there. And we saw from the pictures that people did. That yeah, is the nothing else yeah. is true. Uh, backlash moves swiftly, that's yeah. for sure. That is the National for September the 19th. Good night.